Delmarva Today with Don Rush. At least 14 whales have washed ashore along the East Coast since December 1st of last year, and some have blamed offshore wind turbines for their deaths and are calling for moratorium on their construction. Dr. Brad Stevens is a retired professor of marine and environmental science at the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. So, Brad, I want to turn to you and this whale issue because one of the things that's propped up is the fact that our local congressman, Andy Harris, has called for a moratorium on the offshore wind turbines. And he points to this idea that he wants to examine the ear structure of those who have washed ashore. Let's let's begin there. What, what evidence is there that these, both the construction, but uh, also the seismic activity that you have to deal with in putting these things together, what kind of impact does it have? None whatsoever. There's no evidence, none at all. This is a complete obfuscation and redirection. Uh, whales avoid loud sounds, and they avoid areas where turbines are being constructed. Uh, there is concern, legitimate concern, about how the noise affects them, but there's no evidence that it does. So when you... when in terms of the kind of seismic activity that they use in order to see whether or not you could put something somewhere, I mean, does that have an impact or they pick well, this up or what? Again, this is, this is misdirection. There's, yeah. These whale strandings have nothing to do with seismic activity. There's no seismic activity going on around where these strandings have occurred. The only seismic activity that has been done has been done with regard for whale migration pathways. They've tried to avoid the times and locations where whales are going through. So these recent whale deaths have nothing to do with seismic activity. So what is then the leading cause of the Well, the, the leading cause of human-induced deaths for whales worldwide is, are ship strikes, being hit by a ship, either the bow of the ship or the propeller of the ship. Second to that, the leading cause of death for North Atlantic right whales is being entrapped in fishing gear, primarily uh, buoy lines for lobster traps and other kinds of traps. So in terms of this uh, construction of the wind turbines, um, what kind of argument do you think that's going to be leveled that is going to keep these things from being constructed? I mean... Right now, we've got, as a matter of fact, we have, uh, I think, Ocean City uh, Mayor uh, Meehan, Rick Meehan, who was talking about this in the same vein. you think it's going to have some kind of impact? Well, th this is an argument that's being put forth, I think, as a scapegoat. Uh, over 5,000 offshore wind turbines have been built around the world. And... Over the past 20 years, and if there were connections with whale mortalities, you'd think it would have been seen by now. But there is no evidence linking whale mortalities to any of these anywhere in the world. So to, to bring this up as a potential cause of whale deaths is just an excuse to delay or to cancel or attempt to uh, put obstructions up uh, for the offshore wind power industry. Now, I'm not an apologist for offshore wind. I don't have anything to do with them. I've never had, you know, taken any money from them or anything. I am trying to set the record straight. My expertise is primarily in fishing gear impacts, and I've done a lot of research on fishing gear impacts on whales. That's where we ought to be putting our attention, not wind turbines that don't exist. So what should we be doing in terms of whales, in terms of trying to decrease this mortality? I mean, are there things that we're doing, aside from obviously there's hunting going on in some parts of the world, of course, that we should be uh, trying to avoid doing uh, that uh, impact these whales? Yes. Uh, as I said, the biggest impact are ship strikes. And this is happening where uh, commercial shipping traffic is crossing whale migration routes. A good example is Stowagon Bank up near Boston. This is a big summer feeding ground for North Atlantic right whales, but it's also the entrance to Boston Harbor. So what they've done there is that they've concentrated the ship traffic into corridors that will avoid known whale paths if possible, and they've required ships to slow down so that 
they'd be less likely to hit a whale and cause less damage if they did. This is one of the major things that's being done. The second is uh, organizations are trying to develop uh, whale-safe fishing gear, such as ropeless traps. These are traps that could be used for lobster fishing, say, or black sea bass fishing, that instead of having a line to the surface with a buoy on it, which is what whales get entangled in, would have the line and the buoy attached to the trap, and then it would only be released by the fishing vessel when it's ready to pick up that trap. There's a lot of research being done on that, both uh, within NOAA and uh, groups such as the Woods Hole Oceanographic uh, Institute. And that has the greatest potential for reducing uh, fishing-related impacts on whale mortalities. That's where we should be putting our money. And uh, if Representative Harris wants to help, I'd like to see him uh, support research uh, on whale-safe fishing gear. Help, help NOAA fund that research. So do we have a sense, by the way, as to why we've seen the number of whales um, wash ashore uh, just within recent uh, years? I mean, is there a sense about what's happening there? I think the most likely reason is that whale populations are increasing. Uh, we've, we're not the North Atlantic right whale, unfortunately. That one is still highly endangered. But humpback whale populations are increasing, and humpback whales are one of the species that we're seeing more and more impacted by ship strikes. Uh, as their populations increase, they come more and more into contact with shipping on the East Coast. That can't be avoided except by doing some of the mitigation efforts that we're doing. So when you look at the at the, the politics of this particular legislative area of it, um, do you see that the that lawmakers are taking this under advisement and the idea of having a moratorium, or how do you read the political landscape here? Um, I'm I'm not. <laughs> I'm not really into the politics of this, I, uh, except for what I'm seeing on the front pages, which is mostly the loudest voices, which are the ones that are trying to blame the whale deaths on uh, the wind turbine industry. Uh, what I find um, remarkable is that there are uh, so-called conservation groups that are uh, – taking these claims at face value when they should not be. And, and some of these conservation groups are legitimate, but they've been duped. And some of these conservation groups are actually backed by conservative dark money. Uh, they're not grassroots organizations, and they're using this as an excuse to further their agenda of climate change denial and um, sort of anti-renewable activity. So, by the way, for those groups who sincerely believe they're trying to really do a good job, um, why do you think that they have bought into this then? Lack of diligence is all I can say. All you have to do is a little research and you will find that there's no evidence to support any of these claims. The evidence that exists shows that uh, these whale deaths are caused by ship strikes and fishing gear. So as a future, do you think that you're going to be successful in trying to um, ensure that this message gets across? Um, what, what sense do you get about how people are responding? Now, as you mentioned a moment ago, for instance, we have a piece in the Salisbury Independent about this very thing with a headline saying there's no evidence. Um, do you think you see more of this, and do you think that's going to influence public opinion and lawmakers? I'm, I'm seeing more and more pushback on this idea. Uh, and this particular article includes a number of quotations from NOAA scientists pushing back on this idea that uh, wind turbines have anything to do with whale deaths. And that's a, that's a good sign. That's a very positive thing. Well, we've been speaking with Dr. Brad Stevens. He's a retired professor of marine and environmental science at the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. Appreciate you stopping by and chatting with us. Thank you, Don. You're listening to Delmarva Today. I'm Don Rush. We'll continue this conversation about offshore wind and whale deaths 
with Dave Wilson. He's uh, the Maryland Development Manager for U.S. Wind, the company that will be developing the 80,000-acre offshore wind lease area off the coast of Ocean City. I know Dave and first met Dave as the former executive director of the Maryland Coastal Bays Program, where he worked from 1997 to 2015. You have been a, a local for quite some time. Uh, Dave Wilson, thanks for joining me here on Delmarva today. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, Brian. You know, you've been an advocate as long as I've known you, like I said, and you've been on the front lines of often difficult, often cantankerous, often controversial discussions about many different uh, topics uh, over the years. Talk about how advocacy uh, for whatever topic, whether it's wind or whether it's the bay, talk about how advocacy and that conversation has changed just over the course of your career. Well, I think, you know, not surprisingly, it's the, the level of vitriol has changed, <laughs> to be sure. Um, and it's it's not just with offshore wind, it's with any advocacy for conservation or wildlife. And then the other side might hear something on social or see it on social media, hear it on cert, certain news media outlets. And in the absence of a good sort of base, a good knowledge base in science, uh, natural science in particular, it's sort of easy to, you know, radicalize folks online. And we've seen some of that. And again, with a variety of things, I've seen it gradually get worse over the course of my career. There's no question about that. I was in in those same sort of town halls as you were at the very beginning when this idea and this plan of offshore wind farms off the coast of Ocean City started being brought up at town halls. I think we're we're going back like 2011, 2012, that sort of era. And and I remember people being, you know, as you would expect, frightened of a technology they didn't know and not receptive to a change, whether, however visible, because that's obviously the big conversation is, will you see them off the coast of Ocean City? And, and before we get to all that, I just, I want to take you back to that time and just talk about how the level of frustration, the level of, you know, vehement disdain for this, this thing offshore wind and how that's changed over the course of a decade. Well, again, similarly to other issues, whether it was critical areas law, uh, Forest Conservation Act, other things that we worked with, tried to work with local municipalities and county governments with, uh, the level of, of, again, of vitriol has increased. Certainly, there's no question about it. Um, back then, you know, and still today, it's it's largely about the view shed. Uh, most things I hear when I talk to groups, I talk to the Hotel Motel Restaurant Association, Chamber, others, uh, is about the view set shed. And that, you know, that's that's a viable concern of theirs if, you know, if we don't all have a same subjective idea of what is beautiful or what makes us think that we're moving forward or whatever. You know, some people don't want to see turbines offshore. They'll be certainly hard to see offshore, but nonetheless, some people don't want to see them. Some people do want to see them. But the the, and the level of, of, you know, I think, again, vitriol over that has not changed substantially. It's just that, you know, once people have a position on something, you know, they tend to, you know, it's a cognitive dissonance issue, right? They're trying, they want to see things that support that, you know, their desire to see things a certain right. way. And so, you know, we see some of that with the whale stuff, which, you know, again, as, as you know, Dr. Stevens said that offshore wind's not harming whales it's it's boat strikes and, and to a lesser extent commercial uh fishing entanglements although i don't i, don't, I you know i don't want to i wouldn't certainly uh denounce commercial fishing or commercial fishermen because they're not the primary issue the primary issue really is boat strikes uh especially from tankers and larger boats uh, a lot of these whales are being driven inland uh with with menhaden and whatnot and they're right in the shipping lanes because we can see we have a whale buoy that is creating some great data and unfortunately they're getting hit uh not this has been actually a lesser year uh, compared to other years we've only had 16 whales hit this year and on average we have had about 52 whales wash ashore from maine to florida per year since 2007 so this is actually a relatively light year so which is good to see yeah do you think that because it was just in one uh, you know reasonably small geographic area when you look at the context of the entire country you know over the course of of, of you know a few weeks do you think that that's why the headlines were so took off in the way that it did? Or do you think it was just uh, because this situation is so controversial, 
it was one reason to bring it to the forefront and and make another argument of of, of the merits against offshore wind. Yes, it's probably a little of both. Yeah. You know, the they were concentrated a little bit off New Jersey, but there's also a tremendous amount of boat traffic where these whales were, were uh, washing ashore. And so that was an issue. And then it got to the point where, you know, NOAA Fisheries and the Marine Mammal Commission had to issue a statement saying offshore wind isn't, it's not relevant to offshore wind. This is mostly boat strikes and commercial fishing entanglements. And then, you know, that was followed up by a coalition of 13 environmental groups, in, including the world, the National Wildlife Federation, or excuse me, yeah, it was the National Wildlife Federation, Greenpeace, Natural Resources Defense Council, Surf Rider Foundation, and uh, I think uh, 10 or so others that said, you know, this, we support offshore wind. We understand the science behind this. And we can't, you know, we, again, like anything else, we need to stick with the science. We can't, you know, just fabricate things. It's important as we move forward to, if we're going to have a discussion uh, without yelling and, you know, and just a, a normal discussion, we need to talk about the science and talk about the real concerns that folks might have. Did it surprise you at all being somebody that's that's been swimming in the lane with politicians as an advocate for so many years that this particular situation with the unusual mortality event of the whales dying became picked up by, you know, Congressman Harris and um, various other elected officials up and down the Mid-Atlantic region? Because it is a a real thing with some individuals, certainly Ocean City, yeah. a certain maybe not the majority of Ocean City residents, but with certain folks in Ocean City, the mayor and others, um, it's not surprising that they're elected officials. They have concerns. They pass them on to our congressmen, um, and I'm very glad that they're concerned about wildlife. But again, I you know, offshore it's not relevant. Whale deaths are not relevant to the offshore wind work. It's you know. It's boat strike. So, uh, so the the issue is not surprising that it was brought up to elected leaders, um, and it's not. And again, it's not all elected leaders. Certainly, majority of elect of elected leaders in Maryland don't feel the same as sort of this vocal minority of elected leaders we have down here. But um, it's not that surprising. This is you know kind of the way things play out right. politically. It brings up sort of this idea that I was talking to a to a colleague about, and it's. You know, that idea of you can spend all kinds of time disseminating facts and trying to explain them to people and have a conversation about pe- you know, with people. But it seems that these days, feelings, more so than facts, are driving a narrative. You know, whether it's people denying science to just believe what they see on their particular news channel or, or other things like that. Do you feel that over the course of 10 years of, of advocating for the bay or offshore wind or any of the things, you know, wildlife, as, as you've, you know, been uh, a former Maryland amphibian and reptile atlas coordinator for Worcester County, um, as well as, you know, part of the Maryland bird, uh, breeding bird atlas uh, coordinator for the county as well. You, you've advocated for so many different things. Do you feel this sway towards feelings over facts? Yes, of course. <laughs> I think, you know, anyone not living in the U.S. who said otherwise, I think, would probably be living in some kind of bubble that the rest of us aren't living in. So, so yeah, I do. Uh, but again, you know, we this is a multi-billion dollar project and we can't, you know, we, we can't peddle conspiracies. We need to, you know, stick with the facts, stick with the science, um, stick, you know, listen to reputable news organizations. Um, and again, let, you know, let, the science and discourse prevail over some of the, the non-facts sort of feeling stuff. Feelings are, you know, it's what makes us human. But yeah. when we're discussing, we're trying to have a, a logical sort of rational argument about uh, these things, we need to kind of stick with the facts and the science. We're speaking with Dave Wilson. He's the Maryland Development Manager for U.S. Wind. We're talking about the debates surrounding offshore wind and, of course, about the more recent debates uh, concerning uh, or that are calling for the moratorium of offshore wind development because of a unusual mortality event uh, surrounding a, a handful of humpback whales. So you talk about the fact that the view shed is one of the biggest points. I mean, the Baltimore Sun came out with an editorial that was very scathing against Ocean City saying that their main thing against offshore wind is the view. And while that may seem silly to people that live in the city, uh, for people that, you know, in, or live in Ocean City, I've talked to many of them, this matters. Um, so for once and for all, let, can we 
sort of maybe use this space as to, you know, really dispel any sort of misconceptions about a, the size of these things and, and B how far off the coast they're going to be. Yeah, sure. So, you know, what we, right now we have, we're, we're basically the public service commission is, has basically given us OREX for two projects. Um, the first one is called Marwin. It's 21 miles off the coast. Um, and that will begin in just a few years uh, in terms of uh, basically be up and running. Uh, the second one is called Momentum Wind. That's about 55 turbines, and those are 15 miles offshore. We do not have any awards. We still have a remaining part of the lease area that could hold about 30 or so turbines. Uh, that could go as close as uh, 11 miles from about 84th Street, about 12 and change miles from the from the boardwalk pier. Um, and so... You know, the 15 miles off is going to be real hard to see, but you will be able to see it, especially on dry winter days when the wind's out of the west. you got to remember that the ro- the blades rotate with the wind. And so during the summer, the wind's generally out of the south. And so the blades face south. So they're a little trickier to see. But uh, at 11 miles, uh, you'll be able to see these these 814-foot uh, turbines. Uh, you know, in our construction operation plan, we have a theoretical turbine that would be 938 feet, but that doesn't exist commercially yet. So it could be as high as 938 feet, in which case you would certainly be able to see them in most weather conditions. As somebody who's lived here on the shore for a long time and, and weighing the merits of both sides of this argument, can you understand the concern and worry, very similar to you know, how scared people were before casinos came, you know, before the casino came to Ocean City and gambling came to Worcester County. There was a lot of fear. There was a lot of gnashing of teeth. There was much debate. Do you see the offshore wind situation being similar? I do. Um, that I mean, of course, that's my opinion. Sure. Uh, we have other, you know, studies that showed that actually there's really, really only one Rhode Island study from the University of Rhode Island that, that didn't just do people's opinions. It actually looked at rental rates after the turbines were built off of Rhode Island, which showed that there was actually an increase in tourism. You know, it, given my, given that I spent all my summers in Ocean City and given how I sometimes behaved in Ocean City, of course, uh, but, you know, downtown, I, I just, you know, I, I find it difficult to comprehend that this would affect tourism in Ocean City, um, especially given what's out on the water, um, on a daily basis going by, whether it's sign boats or, or uh, parasailing, uh, whatever. Um, you know, I, I, of course, I personally am looking forward to seeing turbines and thinking, oh, we're moving forward. But not everyone feels that way. And again, that's, that's subjective, and, and I understand um, how, they, how they might feel. Yeah. You know, the, the, the dunes is a good example, too. When we were advocating for dunes uh, uptown, uh, and people said it would ruin their property values, et cetera, et cetera. And now people love the sand dunes. So, you know, um, and, and it did res- help Ocean City look like a more natural state, more like, you know, a little bit more like Acetique looks <laughs> before mm-hmm. it was converted to what it is today. Lastly, I want to speak to you about just sort of being on the front lines of, of, of ad- advocacy for, you know, in this case, an organization with, a, you know, multi-billion dollar project that's in the pipeline. Versus, you know, earlier in your career when you were advocating for wildlife and you were advocating for the bay and the health of it. I know in recent weeks since the whale strikes and Andy Harris and many of the other legislators, including Mayor Rick Meehan, came out, there has been a wave of negativity online that has been directed at you. And some of those negative comments have included death threats. Is this the first time in your career that's ever happened? (laughs) Well... I would call, I wouldn't say there are any death threats. Um, so, you know, there were, you know, indirect ideas of things that, you know, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I don't, you know, I don't, I want to focus on that too much. You know, there's always in any pool, there's always going to be some of those kind of folks. Um, but again, I, I'm, I'm always, I think I've at least over the course of my career been looked at someone who can see both sides of an issue, uh, who kind of likes to tone it down. And, you know, my desire is, as it has been, is to to sit down with folks or have them reach out to me and, and just have a discussion like, like adults would have about um, what the issues are and what are your concerns and just talk about the science. You know, that, that's that's what, you know, adults do and that's what 
you know, will continue to do. Dave Wilson is the Maryland Development Manager for U.S. Wind. Dave, thank you for chatting with me. Uh, it's always good to talk about the facts. It's my pleasure, Brian. Delmarva Today with Don Rush.